Today's revisit was highly requested after we re-reviewed the 2600K and Phenom 2 X6 CPUs and focuses on an even older architecture yet, Intel's Nehalem line. Initially shown at IDF 2007 and launched in November of 2008, this was originally bought before we did hardware reviews even and lived in a personal system for several years. The i7-930 model that we have released in first quarter of 2010 for $294, which was one year prior to the launch of Intel's Sandy Ridge architecture. Today, we're revisiting the i7-930 versus modern CPUs, Phenom 2s, FX, and Sandy Bridge parts, the last of which is arguably one of Intel's best architectures that they've ever shipped to consumer market and just barely followed Nehalem. Before getting to those, this coverage is brought to you by EVGA and their 1080 Ti SC2, which we've recommended fairly highly for its build quality and uh, the ICX sensors, which are kind of fun to play with. You can check our full SC2 review for the 1080 Ti if you're curious to learn more, or you can click the link in the description below to find the product page for the 1080 Ti SC2. Nehalem was a big deal for Intel. It was the appearance of the i5 and the i7 lines, and the one we have particularly is the i7-930. It is a D-stepping chip, so it came a bit later and has some more overclocking headroom than the preceding chips in that line. But just after the i7-930 shipped, about one year, is when Sandy Bridge showed up. And Sandy Bridge performed so well that if you were an i7-930 buyer, you might have felt some buyer's remorse just a short while later. This was back when the gains for CPU architectures were much greater than they are today, perhaps the one difference being Ryzen versus FX, because AMD had, what, five years in between those, so of course they saw much greater gains than Intel does today. So this was a different time in terms of CPU growth and performance and made the releases a lot more exciting. And that's why we're revisiting the 930. It's probably not as widespread as Sandy Bridge, but was still one of the more popular chips, perhaps just after the Q6600. That was a common upgrade path. Q6600 to i7-930 and is actually the one that I took way back then. Now, aside from introducing the Core i5 and i7 series branding, the Nehalem chip that we're looking at also along with its counterparts in this architecture, introduced the four core eight thread approach with hyperthreading for the consumer market. This was not the first time that hyperthreading appeared, but was its reintroduction after what was a pretty rocky launch period for the Pentium 4s with hyperthreading. Back when those launched, uh, Pentium 4s had a whole lot of issues. So this was another attempt at it, and it worked out a lot better. The i3s came a bit later than Nehalem, but the i7s were on an x58 platform, so they were some of the earlier x-series chips before we started doing weird things with x299 like we are today. From a historical perspective, the gaming CPUs on most our charts today will be competing with the $294 i7-930, including the $295 Phenom 2 X6-1090T and the $200 1055T, which launched later that year, just following the i7-930. The $216 at launch i5-2500K is also present, as is the $317 at launch i7-2600K, launched a full year later, and that provides some context for how the 930 was holding up in 2010, but when comparing these CPUs, it's important to keep in mind that the Nehalem architecture had already existed for quite some time. Now, for a modern perspective, from a quick search on eBay, there are multiple listings for i7-930s at or under $40, compared to the overly optimistic prices of $140-ish for 2600Ks, though we did purchase ours recently for about $80, luckily. There are even $65 1055Ts, so that gives us perspective. Our revisits are typically approached from a should-I-keep-it perspective, rather than should-I-buy-it, but the i7-930 is selling cheap enough, less than a G4560 even, that is worth putting an interesting spin on these results. Of course, the I.O. and the platform are aging, so that is a concern, but ultimately, this is an architecture that was introduced in 2007, launched in 2008, and had its final showing in 2010 with the i7-930. Our first test was a rough start for the 930. At stock settings, the multi-threaded score for Cinebench was 474.7 points, just below everything, for the most part. This includes the 1090T that it competed with in 2010. It does, however, beat out the i3 7350K, but that hardly counts, as the 7350K should always be overclocked and never used for production anyway. The non-overclockable and more expensive G4560 and i3 6300, and by more expensive we mean then a modern Nehalem chip, do lose out, 
but again, they are not designed for rendering. However, the 4 GHz overclock increased the score by 34% to 636.3. That new score isn't the highest on the chart, but it is higher than its successor, the stock i7-2600K. Single-threaded performance continues to be among the lowest on the chart, despite increased frequency, but this matters more in gaming than here. Let's move next to Blender. Blender's render time was reduced about the same, 24.7%, putting it right between the i5-7600K stock and OC scores. Other i5s, i3s, and the 6-core Phenom 2s do worse, as does the stock 2600K. More modern CPUs with greater than 4 threads all easily outstrip the aging i7-930. Starting off with our game benchmarks with an older title, more representative of the era, Metro Last Light at 1080p posts the Intel i7-930 stock CPU at 90fps average. Lows are at 63 1% and 59 0.1%, sustained reasonably well thanks to the 8 threads on the CPU. The 2010 i7-930 stock CPU is positioned just behind the 2014 FX8370 stock CPU. For a comparison that everyone can relate to, the i7-2600K operated stock at an average of 111 FPS, posting a 22% lead over the 930. The 4.7 GHz overclocked 2600K counterpart places at 130 FPS average or adjacent to an i7-4790K and R7-1700OC. This shows why Sandy Bridge was so good. Overclocking the i7-930 Nehalem CPU to 4 GHz gets it up to 113 FPS average with high frame time consistency in the lows and thanks to the OC we're now outperforming the 2600K and the R5-1500X stock CPUs. Ashes of the Singularity might be somewhat of a different story, as DirectX 12 doesn't necessarily play it nice with these older CPUs. For the non-escalation version of the game, the i7-930 stock CPU performs an average FPS of 20, with its overclocked variant at 27. This ties the stock i7-930 with the FX8370 once again, and roughly with the i5-2500K. The i7-2600K stock CPU performs at 26.5 FPS average, providing it a 34% lead over the i7-930 stock CPU. Overclocking the 2600K gets it to 33 FPS average, which posts a lessened lead over the overclocked 930 of 23%. The closest rise in chip is the R5-1500X, which manages to maintain a 34% lead over the tired i7-930, though that lead is largely taken away when both are overclocked. If you care for Ash's escalation, they're in the article below. Watch Dogs 2 is one of the more heavily multi-threaded titles and will provide the next best look at how Intel's first consumer 8-thread CPU has aged. The Intel i7-930 Nehalem CPU operates just below 60 FPS average, with lows at 44 and 36. This places it nearly exactly timed in frame time and frame rate with the i5-2500K and allows the i7-930 to maintain a lead over the Phenom 2 x 6190 t 4GHz CPU by 27%. That said, Nehalem looks a bit rough when compared to the 2600K released just one year later, which operates a 74 FPS average for about a 25% speed increase. Overclocking the i7-930 to 4 GHz gets it up to the R5-1500X OC levels of performance, both at 4 GHz, which really isn't so bad for a CPU made 7 years ago. For perspective on Intel's annual scaling, the 7700K operates 92% faster than the stock i7-930, the 6700K operates 88% faster, the 4790K operates 70% faster, and we skip the 3000 series and see the 2600K operates 25% faster, and that's stock for all those numbers. Moving to Total War, Warhammer as a serious CPU stressor, the i7-930 operates a 90 FPS average with high settings, placing it about 32% ahead of the 1090T stock CPU, with the 2500K roughly tied to the 930. The FX8370 actually manages to outperform the stock i7-930 in this particular test, operating a 104 FPS average for a 16.5% lead over the 930. The G4560 notably also manages to outperform the i7-930. Both of these hold a lead because Total War Warhammer is more clock dependent than core dependent as is illustrated by the i7-930's overclocked results. When overclocked, the 930 now runs a 119 FPS average permitting it to surpass the 2600K stock CPU. Just to put these numbers into perspective, the modern i7-7700K holds about a 60% lead over the overclocked 930, though we are close to bumping into the GPU limit at that point anyway. For Battlefield 1, the i7-930 runs an average FPS of 96. This places it just ahead of the X6-1090T 4GHz OC CPU, and just behind the FX8370 stock CPU. 
The closest Ryzen CPU is the R5 1500X at 126 FPS for a lead of 32% over the stock 930. The 2600K for reference is about tied with the overclocked 930 and about 23% ahead of the stock 930. This seems fairly consistent with other tests where the 2600K generally maintains a lead of at least 20% stock to stock testing. Without the context of Sandy Bridge and its timing context, Nehalem would look a lot better. It still looks pretty good though. The CPU has held on reasonably. In most tests, when overclocked, it ties with the i7-2600K. Overclocking gave us about a 20 to 25% gain in gaming and about a 30 to 35-ish percent gain and synthetics, and you can find more of those in the article below. So overall, four gigahertz on it, not bad. That's about what people were pushing on air for the most part back then. And that is coming up from a 2.8 gigahertz clock stock out of the box. This was a later stepping CPU, so it did happen to do a bit better than some of the earlier iterations in the production run. But overall, looking at it today, if you own an Ahalem chip and you're not just watching this because it's cool to see how old the hardware performs, if you own one, the question to ask yourself is, are you happy with its performance? That's always the question. There's a, a lot of the time we get questions of, should I upgrade? It's hard to answer that. There's always a reason you can find to upgrade, but should you? It depends on how you feel about the computer today. Is it doing what you want? If the answer is yes, then keep using it. It's fine. If the answer is no, it's holding you back in production tasks or in gaming, you're not getting the FPS you want. Then we've got all the numbers for you in this video so you can make the comparison to the 930 versus the newer stuff. Ryzen is out, so Ryzen certainly changes things up from the FX series if you've been out of the game for a while. The R5 CPUs are a very good value versus something like an i5, and will give you more production mobility. And then the i7-7700K still does quite well for a pure gaming build. If you're a gaming purist, you're targeting something like 120-144 FPS then the i7-7700K is worth looking at. X299 is also out. We have plenty of coverage on that. And Threadripper is next. So that should more or less catch anyone who's been out of the game for a while up to the current market and then give you some keywords to look for on the channel. We've covered all that stuff by that, this point other than Threadripper, which is TBD. So as always, thank you for watching. You can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. Or you can go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up a shirt like this one. We have tri-blends as well. And as always, subscribe for more. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.